Good evening, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I'm pleased to share that we are providing live captions for this event. To view them, please click on the CC or live transcript button on the, to the Zoom toolbar and select show subtitle. Please also be aware that this evening's event is being recorded and we hope to make it available on the Cambridge University Library YouTube channel next week. Uh, hello and thank you for joining Cambridge University Libraries for this evening's special event to mark UK Disability History Month. My name is Chris Burgess and I'm the Library's Head of Exhibitions and Public Programmes and I am medium height, uh, slightly balding with wild hair, wearing a dark blue shirt and sat in front of um, a big lot of books in my living room. Um, I'll shortly introduce you to Vicky and Molly who are with me on the screen but firstly a little about tonight's event Shifting the Lens. To explore and celebrate the range and power of disab disabled authors we've organised two events with writers and thinkers to discuss disability representation, activism and the written word. This evening for the second of two writing disability events our special guests will take a look at the representation of disability on the stage and screen and a little about uh, tonight's guests. Vicky Reeford Sinnott is an, an award-winning disabled theatre and screenwriter, director, and long-term campaigner for cultural equality of disabled people. She's the founding artistic director of Little Cog, which is a disabled-led touring production company based in the northeast of England. A leading figure in UK disability arts movement for almost 30 years, Vicky's recent work includes the BBC commissioned short film Hen Night and Funny Peculiar, starring BBC Silent Witness star Liz Carr. And chairing the conversation this evening is Molly Carlson. Molly is an MPhil student from the Centre of Film and Screen at the University of Cambridge, with a specific focus on the arc of depictions of disability in the media. She is passionate about the potential that authentic and inclusive representations of disabled folks have for shifting interpersonal and cultural perspectives. After hearing from Vicky and Molly, there'll be time for audience questions. So if you have any questions you would like to put to them, please pop them in the Q&A, which you can find on the Zoom toolbar. Please put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, and we will pick them up after the conversation. That's it from me now. Over to you, Vicky and Molly. Thank you. I will turn off my video as well and give it over to you, Vicky. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. So I'm Vicky. I am a tall white woman in my 50s with um, faded teal messy hair this evening. Uh, I'm wearing a black top with little flowers on it and a colourful scarf. I'm also wearing dark rimmed glasses and I'm seated in my sitting room, I'm sit seated in my spare room, come home study. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak with you all this evening. My talk is roughly 22 minutes um, and I've got a lot to pack in. I've been involved, as Chris said, with the disability arts movement in the UK for almost 30 years. And my presentation tonight is going to reflect on my theatrical and digital work. And also, I'm going to talk about why I feel so passionately about the representation of disabled people. I have worked predominantly in theatre um, for a couple of reasons, but it, it seemed like such a fantastic place to experiment with um, culture and politics and identity. And I am someone who loves the live relationship with audiences. Um, so I think it's possible to make a real difference. However, the other thing is that for much of my career, transitioning to other platforms like TV and film didn't really feel like a realistic option at all, because quite often disabled people were regarded as the recipients of initiatives and training rather than fully fledged writers worthy of commissions. I turned to digital work in the last two years really um, prompted by the need to continue telling stories to keep disabled people visible during the pandemic which actually felt urgent um, and still does. I think it's important to give a context um, to the experience, the scope and scale of disability in the UK. So I am going to talk quite a bit about that, about the context, um, before I mention my own work. Disabled people make up 20 to 25% of the population, and depending on where you are in the country, 70% of us will become disabled as we age. 
So it's actually a natural part of life that our bodies change as we age. Continues to baffle me why we don't handle disability and access better than we do. I came to the arts, um, to theatre, at the tail end of the punk movement in Britain. From my tiny former mining village in the northeast of England, where I didn't have access to theatre, punk allowed me to think about identity and culture in a way, well, in a different way. And, and it was about asking questions that challenged the way things have always been, challenged accepted wisdom and the status quo. I feel that's a very important space from which to examine who we are as a society, culturally, and who we are as individuals. Art is very much about that for me, ensuring that people feel part of something and that it's an active and questioning process. We don't think the way that we do about disability by accident. Nationally, historically, socially, and culturally, we have, in, we have inherited ways of thinking about disability, which are misinformed and which misrepresent us. Disabled academics and activists have critiqued and campaigned against this for over five decades in the UK. Disability is hugely misunderstood as a social phenomenon, the scale of which affects huge numbers of people that I've already alluded to, which so often focuses on the medical conditions of disabled people, presenting us as broke, uh, broken, deficient and less than. We need to radically shift the lens on the representation of disabled people in culture, in literature, in film, TV, theatre, media, poetry, opera, circus, wherever. Um, I personally have a particular interest in disabled women as I believe there are specific things we're expected to embody by society, which reduces our visibility and our voices. However, this is equally true for disabled men, non-binary disabled people, disabled trans people, and disabled children from all of our communities. I am a feminist and I've always been drawn to stories about women. So that just happens to be my context. I work in disabled led practice, which ensures the authenticity of disabled voices and narratives and aims to challenge dominant negative thinking around dis the dis disability as I've described. But I will explain this practice as I talk. Thinking about disabled led work specifically and shifting the lens on disability has been twofold for me. There's the, there's the, the big shift of the big lens publicly to challenge commonly held negative perceptions. But there's also the lens that we use for ourselves as disabled women, performing in public, putting ourselves in the public eye, which I will also talk about. So why do I make the work I make? I make it for a number of reasons. True to punk, my first, uh, my work aims to challenge accepted wisdom and these negative associations that I'm referring to. But also I passionately want to create new disabled characters to add to the cultural pantheon, to tell the stories that need to be told to truly reflect who we are as a society and to ensure that disabled audiences, children and adults alike can see themselves in culture. So before talking about my own work, like I said, I'm going to reflect on um, how traditionally stories have been told about disability, leading to a series of unhelpful stereotypes and tropes, looking at how disabled characters have been traditionally presented in film and the media. I'm going to reference ancient Greece um, first, though, because we have over 2000 years of misrepresentation to address, so a mighty shift is required. In ancient Greece, people believed in perfect gods, and the more perfect a person was, the closer they were to the gods. The less perfect a person was, the less good they were perceived to be, and the less value they had. And this value remains true today, placed on people today, but particularly disabled people. Um, whose bodies, minds or senses might be um, different to prescribed norms. 
it's a pressure and exclusion on millions of us. And it's all around us from handsome princesses, uh, princes and beautiful princesses in childhood fairy tales, through to advertising, which includes dominant gendering. And then anyone who falls outside the prescribed norms is less acceptable and less than. However, there are and have been some fantastic thinkers in the disability rights movement in the UK. The late Paul Hunt, an early disabled activist, identified 10 stereotypes of disabled people which dominate film, literature, TV and theatre. And the amazing Dr. Paul Dark did an, oh, a fantastic piece of research with the British Film Institute into stereotypes of disability in hundreds of films. And I think you can still find that on the BFI website. The stories, therefore, that we've been told, the lessons we've learned, the information we've been given, entrench a medicalized thinking about broken and tragic disabled people. And these stereotypes and tropes perpetuate a lower status as citizens, which is harmful in times of pandemic. Culture and society are completely interrelated. I will mention one exception, which is, is the stereotype around being super capable or superhuman, like the Paralympians were presented as superhumans, brilliant athletes, but the narrative was taken out of their hands. And that superhuman narrative throws shade on the majority of disabled people who, like most other humans, are just trying to get on with their lives. Some examples of stereotypes then, and I want to issue a trigger warning on this around um, themes of death. As you can imagine, stereotypes aren't pleasant and disabled people's representation across history hasn't, hasn't been great. So I'll, I'll just list some of the, the, the stereotypes identified by Paul Hunt. <coughs> Excuse me. Pitiable and pathetic characters like Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol, a two-dimensional character he was almost a foil for Scrooge's great turnaround at the end, giving us all a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. We're often presented as victims. So in the old film, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Blanche is abused by her sister. We're shown as the butt of jokes. Forrest Gump, a character with no agency, things happen to him as he stumbles um, from situation to situation accompanied with sentimental wisdom. We see incapable of independent stereotypes. A, a recent Hollywood film, Me Before You, is a good example of that. Evil or inherently bad, uh, which is a common association with disability. Every James Bond villain that you can think of is, is probably a disabled character in some way, right up to the current date where the, the latest villain has facial difference. Super Crips or superhumans. Um, Christy Brown was played by Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot, a good example of a super crip. Disabled people apparently aren't interested in sex at all, no sex lives. Um, and so we often see this in association with disabled veterans like born on the 4th of July. <coughs> Excuse me. We also see outcasts. Um, you know, a stereotypical outcast. So Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame is cast outside society to live separately, to live a different sort of life. We also have wise sages or curiosities, such as John Merrick in The Elephant Man. It's not just characterization. As a writer, um, I know from the composition of the stories that I tell, I want the narrative to be accurate, authentic, and not damaging to disabled people in any way. As well as the stereotypes, <clears throat> there are lots of negative tropes that hang around about disability. Common and unhelpful stories. Examples might include disability is a personal tragedy, leading to the tragic but brave trope, or showing that it's, not a, it's a life not worth living. People are written off, um, or that we're defined by our suffering. There's also inspiration porn, which um, makes non-disabled people feel better about themselves. There's the overcoming of tragedy or even disability itself at times. 
Sometimes we have magical senses and sometimes we have a super ability to compensate for being disabled. A couple of examples of disabled character tropes um, always, always performed by non-disabled actors. Um, these hugely problematic examples include the film Rain Man, where we see a stereotypical savant, um, awful mimicry of speech and movement of an autistic person. And really, it's his brother's story, and he's just the foil. Um, people will, I'm sure, be aware of the film Music by Sia. Uh, there was an outcry on social media. Awful mimicry, again, of a perceived condition. And also that film endorsed um, outdated treatment uh, of autistic people. Me Before You um, shows a personal tragedy. The person perceives himself to be worthless, who becomes disabled, a burden. He has internalized self-loathing and sadly took his own life. That story is so common that it's untrue. It's caught, we know it as the better dead than disabled trope. And obviously non-disabled people playing disabled characters is usually shallow and bears no relation to the cultural, historical and social layers of disability. <clears throat> so what stories need to be told and by whom? I've mentioned amazing activists and academics. There are also many, many well-established amazing disabled artists. And I'd like to acknowledge a few of them by name now. This list is by no means exhaustive and there are many others. Cheryl Martin, Miranda Walker, Lizette Orton, Kate Lovell, Simon Starton, Lawrence Clark, Justin Edgar, Julie McNamara, David Proud, Kim Takizi, Genevieve Barr, and if you haven't heard the Jack Thorne McTaggart lecture about representation in broadcasting, do check it out. He kind of summarizes what many activists have been saying for decades. So disabled led work um, is about authenticity of writing and casting, of producing and directing. But the lens is firmly fixed on a narrative which is disabled led, which can be political, is about social and cultural justice, visibility, presence and profile. Disability absolutely informs the work and we see missing stories are told. The aesthetics of access um, have found their way onto the stage with integral BSL, audio description, creative captioning, but we've yet to see this transfer to film and television. I'll talk through some examples of my, my work, which have either toured nationally or been commissioned as digital screen works. It can be tricky to feel the weight of responsibility to get things right, to redress the balance and put everything right in one piece of work. Um, it's tempting to try, but I'm lucky enough to have built up a body of work with the support of amazing allies, funders, disabled artists and my family. Um, so yeah, examples of things that I've been involved with. I'm going to begin with a conversation I had the huge privilege to host, talking to four disabled women performance makers in the Wrong Woman discussions. This was for Home Manchester and Ark Stockton as part of the Homemakers Commissions in the pandemic. I spoke to Julie McNamara, B. Webster, Melissa Johns and Tammy Reynolds. Um, our recorded conversations accompanied a short solo drama piece, which I wrote and was partially informed by the conversation. Our discussions revolved around transgressing, what is expected of us as disabled women and having agency over ourselves in performance, which can be challenging. We discussed our experiences and how to navigate a world which at times feels actively exclusive and unwelcoming, and also how to navigate that world's need for us to be educators. So we're constantly explaining, making a case, or going over our traumas. How do we avoid being tokenistic novelties and actually build a longer term presence? We talked about our different positions on working in the mainstream or in more radical arenas. Connected to this, we talked about the work we make, for some of us, it was about challenging stereotypes, absolutely. 
For others, it was um, connected. No, sorry, it was about self-realization, about communities, seeing ourselves represented. And also for some of us, it was about the intimate audience connection with our peers. We all feel cautions around playing out our trauma and giving too much of ourselves in public performances. It's something we have to think about. Artist Tammy Reynolds has talked about performing disability whenever um, they're out in public as someone with dwarfism, feeling like public property, which disabled people often do. How we're discussed and criticized on social media um, for example, Sia's film, she was incredibly defensive about the criticism. Ricky Gervais and Simon Pegg have both recently engaged with, um, with disabled people who have commented, you know, about their, about their humour. Um, and they've, you know, they've described us as just being um, sensitive and choosing to be offended. Another example of work um, is Hen Knight, which was commissioned by the BBC as a one person short focusing on a young disabled woman who's dependent on social care for her independence. I worked with journalist Frances Ryan um, as the piece was inspired by her book Crippled about the impact of austerity on disabled people in the UK, something that I come back to a lot in my work. It was essential to us that our character Jessica, a young 20 something woman who goes out drinking with friends, is engaged to be married and is training to be a teacher at a local school, was not portrayed as a victim, either of her condition or life generally. Her story is, is not tragic. Uh, disability is part of her identity, but as her story is told, what we traditionally expect of disabled people is revealed. Her family have always tried to get her to hide her difference or to overcompensate, to smile a lot, to make other people feel comfortable, to not rock the boat. It's a multi-layered piece with various threads, and I hope that Jessica is an interesting disabled protagonist um, who challenges, um, yeah, what we see in mainstream or traditional representation. I also directed a piece called Funny Peculiar, which has a comic element and was inspired by the pandemic. The narrative around disabled people changed in the pandemic, and suddenly we were vulnerable people who seemed expendable. So I wanted four intersectionally diverse old women <coughs> who are leaders in their, own in their own communities or in their own lives. Yes, they experience discrimination and judgment, but they're fully rounded three-dimensional characters, bold, strong, surprising, and funny. <coughs> Excuse me. Lighthouse um, is a, 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 a stage piece I created, which was bilingual BSL and spoken English about two women trying to save a lighthouse. Another England um, national touring production was about austerity. It was about uh, the treatment of disabled people in society, uh, putting people into camps and removing citizenship before any of that had begun. Butterfly was a solo um, female piece that challenged the historical development of stigma around mental health. And then the art of not getting lost was another people, two women gathering objects of significance from across the history of disabled people. <clears throat> Although they were all very different pieces, there are some common threads. So just finally, I want to say something about non-disabled people working with disabled stories and characters. Disabled people want better representation. We do want to be seen on television. And at the moment, the power lies with non-disabled people, with non-disabled writers and producers. <clears throat> so what, what would we say about better representation and not falling into the traps of those awful stereotypes and tropes that I mentioned before? Remembering disability is not a metaphor for something else. Disabled people are not wise sages for non-disabled characters, and we're not inspiration porn to make non-disabled pe people feel better about themselves. I thought I'd just give a couple of examples of, of things that it's important to do if you are writing disabled characters and stories. <clears throat> Talk to disabled experts and advisors and um, make sure there's a budget line to pay them for their expertise. 
be aware that not all disabled people are aware of tropes and stereotypes because actually we don't get educated anywhere about this and they are deeply entrenched in how we think. Ensure disabled characters aren't foils, as I mentioned. Um, disabled characters have their own desires and ambitions. Always check the details. Don't make assumptions. Not all blind people use Braille. Not all deaf people lip read. Not all autistic people are amazing at maths. Do the research. Research disabled led approaches and make sure you know about tropes and stereotypes. Think about accessibility in your processes, locations and facilities. <coughs> Think about the length of your shoot ask for access requirements and budget for them. Cast disabled actors to play disabled characters and cast disabled actors to play any characters. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm, I'm so pleased that you've listened. Thank you very much indeed. I'm now gonna invite Molly to come back onto the screen. Um, we're gonna have a chat. Don't forget to put any questions in the Q&A. Um, so Molly, can I invite you to just um, introduce and describe yourself? I'm back, yes. Um, I'm Molly. I'm also a white woman in my 30s. I'm sitting in a sofa chair. I've gone on a pink sweater and short brown hair. Um, I have silver earrings and hearing aids. And um, I'm really, really grateful for everything that you shared, Vicki. Thank you very much. I think uh, I think that was wonderful. I think. Um, you know, the societal and, and personal context that you've shared is, um, it's just really exciting to see the impact of the work you're doing. And I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to launch right into my question unless you have anything else to say, but okay, I'm taking it around. Let's, with it. Okay. let's <laughs> go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think especially the history for me was so eye opening. It's about uh, pushing back against millennia of inherited kind of ableist, uh, Mr. you know, misconception and I yeah. yeah and the work that you're doing is is very charged and pushing back and necessarily so um and so I will just begin with oh go ahead were you gonna say something oh no okay I'm going to begin with just a question um about your creative process and I know that you've you've mentioned the representation the mainstream representation of disability they don't resonate um as a disabled individual simply it doesn't it's not who you are it's not anyone you know um and like the unhelpful tropes and stereotypes that you've mentioned and I'm curious to know how you navigate the process of writing and creating in such a way that it's not simply a reaction to those it's more like an, is it a standalone sort of you know story or is it um or maybe you do react to them but I'm curious what that looks like in your creative process yeah this is um <clears throat> this is a really interesting question, actually. And for me, I, I, I kind of I mentioned that art is action. Um, and, you know, it's an active process and hopefully brings out active engagement. That's my aim when I'm, I make a piece of work. So art is action and it's also an intervention with the framework of beauty and power, you know, aesthetics and craft. Um, so in one way, I obviously hope that my work isn't a reaction, but more of an intervention. So, you know, so there's there's that. Um, but the other thing is that all artists have unique processes. Um, my process is as an is an artistic one first, um, and so I'm when I start something, I'm thinking about the story. I'm thinking about my characters, and I'm getting passionate about them and how well rounded I can make them. Um, they they take over and have their goals and desires and I'm also thinking visually too because my work tends to come to me in pictures. Um, the other thing is that I write about what I know that old adage that many people use but it's true for me. I research and I study people and the other thing is that I involve other people in my process. So I probably potentially could quite happily yet yeah, you know pump out a really good rant <laughs> that, that is a reaction and sometimes we have to do that just to get it out and then we finesse and then we go back and but the collaboration I think with other artists makes sure that there are other voices in there um and um yeah I like to to bring people in at an early stage actually and have creative conversations 
Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, as an artist, I hope that there's authenticity that comes comes through that. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't, yeah, the other thing I suppose is that there are identifiers in the work. This is a really interesting thing about aesthetics that quite often disabled audiences will see things in the work that they see because they have an experience of it or they connect with it in some way that non-disabled people might not notice. Um, and so there are, I hope, unique elements of the aesthetic that take it beyond a, a reaction. But I mean, what, what, what's your, I'm interested, what's your experience of seeing disabled led work? Do you think we nav navigate that reactive approach well? Or is it a challenge? I uh, ooh, wasn't expecting a question back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just you're so no, no, no. knowledgeable as well. <laughs> well, I think uh, what you say about more of the identifiers um, and when I'm watching, I can watch a show and I, uh, I have seen um, uh, being hard of hearing part of the deaf community, um, having seen some depiction of people who are in my exact situation uh, and I can identify something that can, doesn't feel authentic and I <laughs> But yeah. I react off the screen. I'm sitting watching. I'm like, I get so, you know, and I, yeah. it, that can be so more. I, I think I have more experience seeing non authentic, inauthentic uh, depictions, if that makes sense. And so, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's just the nature, that's just the nature of the current, the current uh, environment. Um, but I, yeah. but I do, yeah, that has been my experience. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank well, I, I think it's really interesting what you said also about, uh, being an artist first, and yeah. I and I know that you're also a you're a political activist as well, and yeah. so that's one of the things I was wondering too is how do you how do you ensure that art comes first because you are having to push back against millennia of sort of you know inherited wisdom and so how like with that kind of charge behind your art, you know what uh, what is that? Yeah, yeah. This uh, this is one of my favorite things to think about. <laughs> I love uh, being a political artist, you know, you, you do, you're, you're constantly wrestling. Um, but I trained as an artist, you know, I was really lucky. I got hooked by theatre as an art form and loved it. I love the buzz. I love the instant nature of it. I love the dynamic and that connection with the audience, as I said. I love the skill and the craft, you know, of, th of theatre. Um, that, that's the challenge is to be able to take a political thought or idea and absolutely transform it into another world with with characters that are credible and relatable and relevant but yeah i mean it, it i am polit you know i was politicized in my teens i grew up in the northeast of england which is is political a place um and i don't know how to separate that from myself but what i would say is that if I want, you know, if I wanted to just write a, a, a kind of a political leaflet about issues, then that's what I do. Or I'd write a blog, you know, um, the, yeah, it, it, for me, it's about, it's about, I trained as an artist, I, I developed some skills, hopefully I craft the art and the politics and, and make them work together. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, it is, it is, it is tricky. Um, but I've got some new pieces coming up and we evolve, don't we, as artists? There's some new pieces coming up, which I hope will be interesting and surprising for audiences. They definitely will be political, uh, you know, but but maybe just in a different in a different way. So I'm really excited about that. And it, it's ultimately about the human experience, isn't it? So, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I, I loved when we first spoke and you told me about your early exposure to the punk movement. I got all of my wheels turning. I was like, that makes complete. And I was envious that I hadn't been exposed to it earlier because I think I might be a different person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, and you can, punk also isn't it both. It's, it's, it's political and it's art. So yes, I can yeah. Imagine. Early training ground, yeah. <laughs> early training ground, yes, exactly. Uh, I also have one more question about your creative process, which is, um, is more of a personal question, but in uh, you know, in shifting the lens, you're challenging all those assumptions, those inherited wisdom, as you said, and I think they can um, they can impact us, uh, perhaps especially so as disabled. They can trickle down and they can become internalized. Yeah. And I'm just curious if you've ever 
through your course of your work, maybe, un, you know, unearth something internalized and how that might uh, factor into the final piece, how it might be, a, you know, a revelation or something of sorts. And because I, I, from experience, I, that is something that I've grappled with where I'll find mm -hmm. out, I'll, I'll come in, I'll encounter a thought and I, oh, I can't do that because I won't hear, you know, I just, I, it's just, it'll be like, I just stop myself before I've even begun. Yeah. And I don't have, you know, an outlet, I'm not an artist, but I, I'm curious if that's something that's, that resonates or. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, so I um, didn't, I haven't always identified as a disabled person. I wasn't born disabled. So I, I acquired um, a, a variety of conditions as, you know, throughout my life, but actually mental health, um, which was the first area that I had identified um, as a disabled person. I didn't know I was allowed to be a disabled person at first. And so um, I had internalized a lot of stuff about around mental health and, you know, the usual stuff that people do. When I learned about the social model, I still wasn't quite sure where mental health fitted because it's so attached to that word health, um, you know, and so I did, I did, I mean, as you know, as I came out as a disabled person, I was learning all the time. I was changing and evolving. But there absolutely I've absorbed a lot. I've internalized a lot of stuff. Um, for a while, <coughs> I was determined to be the nicest person anybody ever met. I tried to be really efficient and well organized and a pleasure to work with. And I became a perfectionist, which is really not good. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of us do. We want to prove our place. Um, but the other thing is, I mean, other things about me, I, I'm obviously much older now and I've, I've gone through various changes and I did internalize. Uh, no, not. I kind of became fixed in my thinking for a good while about how change was possible. Um, and I, I wasn't moving and I didn't like some of the new ideas and eventually. Um, I realized I was the problem in that situation and so <laughs> conversa you know it's great when you've got you can introduce two characters to have that conversation on your behalf <laughs> and they can they can work it out you know um that's an ongoing way <laughs> yeah 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 but it is it is tricky not to put too much of yourself on stage ah uh, I'm sure I'm sure I yeah, yeah no thank you I the next list of questions I have are more practical as opposed to the creative process. But I think we have a couple of minutes for my questions before I turn Super. to the audience question, because I really wanted to ask this, especially because it's, it's what I'm the most interested in in my own studies. Um, I've, I, as a theater goer myself, I found it really hopeful what you said about the aesthetics of access in, uh, in theater. Yeah. So how uh, they've uh, found increased grounding or they're, gain they're gaining ground. Um, and that was, and I know you gave some wonderful examples of people who were in the industry as well. And I'm so curious to know what, what you would hope to see or what you have. I mean, and you mentioned some wonderful examples in the theater, like a uh, creative captioning and, and, and yeah. not, um, what would you hope to see? Like, is there anything in particular that springs to mind that you'd hope to see in uh, film and television or more you would like to see of uh, in the theater? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, first I'm going to reference, so I, I was in this cohort of, of 12 artists, disabled artists, and we were, we were um, commissioned by the BBC for Culture and Quarantine. All the films are on iPlayer, so what I'm going to suggest is that people check those films out. Google Culture and Quarantine, disabled people, and I, they will all come up. Now, there's an amazing piece that's called Louder Is Not Always Clearer by Johnny Cotson who's a deaf artist, incredible performer. And it's a brilliant example of integral BSL. Now, obviously that's Johnny's language, but also it's, it's used really creatively in the piece. And it works, it works brilliantly as a piece of television. And so I think there are ways that, that we can learn from that. And, and, and the 12 pieces all bring different things. And so it would, oh God, you know, we had tiny grants for those films, but if we were invested in and there was space to explore the aesthetics of access, I just think it, it would be amazing because people, you know, people have talked about seeing pieces of theatre where it absolutely enriched the audience experience to see the integral BSL or audio description. 
audio description you can be really creative and clever with that as well it's it's part of the aesthetic and yeah it, i mean primarily it's about access but if we can make it beautiful and lots of us do that then i think there are some i think there are some beginnings of really interesting thinking happening yeah yes 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 <clears throat> i think that's so true i remember i actually got to see a integrated asl play like eight or nine years ago um spring awakening and I, I i at that point i was very nascent in my own sign language and i but it, I, and just seeing it though it was really beautiful like you said so even if you don't have exposure yeah. experience it can be with the integration like you said can be it can really it can enrich absolutely experience. yeah so that's a really wonderful thing ah wonderful i <laughs> i want to ask um some of the audience questions that we're getting um that i will just start off right there a question from from anna ward um what do you think is the biggest barrier to to improving disability representation in cinema or the theater the biggest barrier is that uh, is poor education on the parts of decision makers of people of influence of um so we've talked, you know, we've talked about diversity for a long time. We've talked about disability equality. And even though people in broadcasting have seen the reports, they've seen the data, they still hold the entrenched psyche of the nation on disability. And if we, if we can't shift that thinking, it's going to be really difficult for them ever to see us as fully fledged individuals i do think there's some change coming you know um unfortunately because of my age and possibly because i'm a little bit cynical i have seen lots of things rise up and then we get dropped because we're not the flavor of the month anymore but i think <clears throat> you know not enough people in decision making positions purse holders fully appreciate disability as a social phenomenon or the cultural history the socio-political experiences and still have that less than perspective and that you know they're still thinking about disability in that way they possibly think we're just going to make lots of miserable films about suffering or you know i don't i don't know what they think we're going to make <laughs> thankfully you know people are we are we're seeing little bits of examples of really excellent work um but there is, there's a, a long way to go. There's a long way to go in the broadcasting industry. And lovely that we've seen some, some new pressure groups rising. Um, Jack Thorne, who I mentioned before, um, has, has created a new pressure group for television. He's a highly influential voice, you know, so people are listening to him. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, hopefully, I think I've seen some changes as well. I think even within, you know, my, <laughs> paying attention, you know, <laughs> so yeah. I think we can see some changes and you've got also the, you have the, the bigger, you know, cinematic studios are also paying attention down to, you could trickle down people, people who are not even, people who don't need it or may not even know someone who needs it are paying attention as well, yeah. which is, I think is, it's not just, you're not having to just advocate for yourself. Yes. Which can be the hardest part. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wonderful. We're getting more questions then. Um, so I'll just I'll pop onto another one from Anonymous. Um, in your writing, do you tend to highlight the problems that disabled people encounter every day? Or do you focus more on their experience in general? And how do you go about that balance? Wow, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I would probably arrive at, at writers start starting points are different some people will start with a story some will start with a character i start with a political idea and have have to find the story and have to find the characters so um because it's a, a political idea um usually i need to pick the things that will best serve the telling of a story around that idea um, and so the characters would be developed first and they would have, you know, as all characters do in drama, they would have a conflict to resolve or they would have a goal that they're trying to achieve. And quite often in my work, um, I do create work that's in what I call hopeful dystopias. 
So there's a dystopia that represents the challenges, the oppression, and the experiences, um, but that, that we've got to weave hope into that somehow. So the, the hope comes through the individual characters. But in terms of whether it's the everyday experiences, I'll, if I use butterfly as an example, it, it look back at the history of, um, of how, the develop, uh, how stigma developed around mental health. And my character, uh, Beatrice, in that. So individually, personally, she was having to endure a compulsory assessment. So it was about her experience of the system and how she was um, not really given a voice. She was locked in a room. But then around that, I, I interwove other characters that came from history. And um, she told the whole story. You know, she, she revealed all of this. So, so there's a bit of a mix between what we experience daily, the oppressions we experience, but then I do try to put it in that epic social framework. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, Hen Night as well, I remember was pretty, it was very like rooted in daily, but also talking about, it was, it felt very casual. <laughs> it felt like, you know, you're <laughs> a friend and then you've got talking about these big changes that are happening in the UK and, and yeah. it, but I'm just going out with friends, you know, and it's sort of a, a balance there, so. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, it's tricky, but it's yeah, yeah, part uh -huh. of the joy too. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have some more questions if you're ready. <laughs> ready? Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to mispronounce this name, and I'm very sorry, but Cheng Yi Li is asking. Um, in British cinema theaters, <laughs> I've noticed this as well, so I'm happy that someone has brought this up. In British cinema theaters, there are no subtitles for English-speaking films by default, uh, which is the case in a lot of developed countries. The situation then become a barrier for people who are uh, foreigners or immigrants or with hearing loss. So what do you think of this? And I also will say that when I go to uh, the cinema in the US, we've got uh, little captioning devices that we just plop into our cup yeah. holder, but it's, it has, it's not a thing here. And I, I guess the question is, what do you think of this? So it's- Well, absolutely. It definitely needs to be a thing here. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it, to me, in the 21st century, it doesn't make sense anymore that we don't have this as, 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 a, as an option. Um, and, you know, uh, in, in terms of just thinking about it in terms of um, deaf access or, or other, or, you know, lots of other people use captions and uh, neurodiv neurodivergent people use captions. It, yeah, it just, it's, it, it's baffling, but the deaf community has fought for a long time. And yet we still only see maybe two films out of 10, uh, you know, are going to have captions and they're going to have like them. 9 p.m. <laughs> it's way too late. <laughs> I'm like, I can't make it. <clears throat> yeah, or 5.30, you know, when deaf parents are feeding their kids or, it, yeah, yeah, and it, it's just, it's so frustrating and yeah. it, it, it shouldn't be. It really, it, the answers are there, you know, we just, we, we just need to see them happen. But the, the wheels of progress seem to turn very, very slowly. Yes, slower than they need to be. Well, absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have, I think we have, I think we have time for a few more questions of which, which we do have. Um, one of them is from another anonymous attendee asking, what kind of tropes would you like to see replacing the harmful ones? I mean, that are commonly used in the media. It is an interesting question. I don't know if tropes are what you want to see or if there's some sort of you know recurring maybe a recurring uh characteristic that you would want to see yeah i i mean I, i'm not really sure how to articulate the tropes that i want to see because i suppose because um i look at every story individualistically it, it, the, the, that i'm creating um but that is a very good question and something i will definitely be thinking about later um, but in terms of, of how we're represented, um, for, for me, there's going to be a series of stages because like progress is always a continuum, isn't it? And, and for me, we definitely need to see some disabled led work where disabled people are making the decisions about the content um, and where disabled people are multidimensional, not always perfect because that's just as bad. Um, <laughs> You know, if we, I, I'd love to always tell stories about amazing warriors and, 
you know, but we, we have to we have to face the realities of every human being. So I do want to see complex characters, but I do I really want to see some of the balance tip the other way in terms of like all that negative stuff. I, I personally like to see um, work that has got cultural significance, um, that, that places disability in, in a particular context, um, you know, and that, that that work does contain meaningful things for disabled people. Um, so I suppose when I'm creating work, I'm all the time trying to think about how to expose some things um, but also to allow the character their journey. Um, so I kind of I've never thought of putting it into into describing it as a trope, but I'm I'm going to think about that now. That's that's <laughs> actually really helpful. So yeah. Thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so too. I, I've never I mean, because tropes can be so reductive, can't they? And yet they're kind yeah. of inevitable because I think if you get a certain like a, over a large body of work, they're going to see some yeah. recurring things. So why not make them positive or at least yeah 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 realistic or yeah yes. yeah, yeah. Huh. um we have one more question i think that's probably it's a longer one so probably all we have time for um this one's from joseph and the question is when you're writing for the stage or another medium what actions do you take to improve accessibility for a disabled viewer um do you consider the stage layout blocking what other consideration do you consider important, not just for access, but also an elevated experience for disabled viewers, which is interesting. I don't know if you, yeah, if that. Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll, think, I'll think about the practical, <coughs> the practical as, access things first, if I may, and then we'll come back to the elevated experience. Um, Gosh, there's so much that we think about from the beginning and it's, it's built into the planning of any project. You know, as a disabled woman myself, my starting point is accessibility. So um, I think about the actors involved and what their access requirements are. So if I've got deaf actors on stage, then we always, you know, there is, we have to have accessible blocking. We have to have accessible mechanisms for queuing you know, for cues, <clears throat> same for visually impaired actors, we have to find creative ways to cue each other. Um, and so then that we factor in the audience and what the audience will see or hear um, or experience. And so um, we do kind of think about stage positioning. If, if audience, you know, we think about the audience being able to see the full face and the mouth um, and not have you know, people going off over there, so things can't be seen or heard. And um, there was, so, you know, I, that sounds incredibly simplistic as, as I describe it, but actually it's quite complicated. Yeah, it sounds really complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, um, you know, we've, uh, we've had, <clears throat> there's some amazing people. Sarah Pickthall is an amazing disabled um, artist who I admire enormously. And she's done um, some, some access dramaturgy around pieces of work and you know it, it's a, it's an art form in itself almost but it is it, it you know um in terms of um bsl i'm not a big fan of a bsl interpreter standing off to the left or to the right detached from everything because it splits the focus of the the deaf audience the bsl user audience and so finding ways to, to make it integral where the interpreter moves around or is even, you know, is part of the piece is really important for me. Audio description that is delivered by the actors rather than um, through a set of headphones, at, quite often at really high speed, where actually we've thought about how long it takes to process information about the visuals. So there's quite a lot that we do. <clears throat> now I'm trying to the elevating the experience of the disabled audience on one level I don't really understand what that means but on another level I'm thinking and I don't mean that to, I'm flippantly I, you know I genuinely would love to know a little bit more about that <clears throat> but I want disabled audience members to feel seen to know that the experiences that they have somewhere are reflected in the work 
that they're part of a community possibly um if they choose to be and that you know that we're we're creating work to make sure that all the stories are told that the stories that have been missing are present um and that we you know there's there's a there's a i'm passionate about trying to do that as well as i can and i know when i've gone to see other work by disabled artists artists sorry to feel connected to feel seen and also for that work to be of really high quality you know well thought out and, and really well produced that just speaks to me that says you know it says a lot to me and that's what i want people to take from from seeing my work to know that we've worked really hard um to share our community i suppose that sounds elevated to me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope that answers in some way. Thank I you for that some, question. Yeah, there's something really magical about uh, when you are the intended recipient of a show. There's something really that you don't, and you're normally like just trying to get it. You're just trying to, you know, and I'm like uh, normally when you're just trying to like, I'm yeah. just trying to get the context of the, you know, as opposed to, oh, this is designed with me in mind. That's a really different experience, and so, yeah, yeah. 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 Ah, oh, we have, we've landed it just at the mark, I think, for our allotted time. There were some fantastic questions. Thank you to ah, everybody. And thank I'm, you, Molly. I'm starstruck. Yeah, thank you, audience. And thank you. Yeah, I'm, this was fantastic for me. <laughs> Hi, Chris. I just want to say, um, I, I didn't actually want to uh, come back there because I was enjoying your conversation so much, uh, Vicky and Molly. And it, it's a shame, I feel, to... Um, uh, to to stick my head in the middle of it, but um, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, so much, Vicky, for talking to us, um, and uh, to Molly for facilitating the conversation. I think there was some really um, interest interesting things uh, there that I'm I'm going to take away. Um, uh, the fact, Vicky, that your art grows out of punk now becomes really you know I, I, it wasn't something I was aware about before but it's, it's now makes all the sense in the world um and like many of the best things about <laughs> punk I think um um but also things about which we we, we try to think about the university I'm just gonna talk person now if that's okay but things about the university library about access not being something that's bolted on the side but you you, you think about from the start how do we how do we do better to to make it kind of part of part of the process of of producing cultural cultural work in whatever form it is how how is access at the center of that and access as an art form i love as a a kind of idea which i'm gonna uh, take away um but it was it was it was it was it was really fascinating and um yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry we only had an hour um but it was it was really interesting so thank you very much for for speaking to us um as i mentioned at the start of today's event uh, this is the second of two um writing disability events are uh, First was held in November and discussed the uh, representation of disability and difference in children's literature. That talk's now available on uh, Cambridge University's uh, YouTube channel. Um, so uh, uh, please go and check that out. And, and we also hope to upload this evening's talk on there as well in a couple of days. So do go and uh, check those both out again, um, send them to people who you might be interested. You know, the content is there and we want people to look at it. The other thing I would like to say is um, tomorrow you will get uh, 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 an email uh, asking you for some evaluation. Um, uh, if you do have a few seconds, please do fill it in. We do read it. We don't just send out emails asking for feedback because uh, it's the right thing to do. We do listen. And I think we are particularly interested in, uh, you know, how we might carry on this conversation around this, around disability, about writing disability. Um, all these ideas come from the university library holds you know, 11 million items. It, it represents so many different voices and we want those voices to come out in as, in as many ways possible. So um, uh, if you do have any thoughts, just, you know, get in contact with us, let us know what you want to, you want to talk about, what you want us to hear more about, please do, please do that. Um, we're really interested in what, in what people think. Um, you know, we want to, we want to produce things that people want to, to see, if that makes sense. So um, um, please do get in contact. Um, and again, as I'd like to say a, a huge thank you um, uh, to Vicky and Molly for their insights this evening. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us and, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All the best now.